<sighs> but like, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. It's actually pretty funny because, like, I was all like paranoid. Okay, I started thinking that I didn't want to see it. Pero luego estábamos escribiendo. Oh, me escribió la otra noche. And we we're just like joking around. All right, I'm going to give it a minute or two for people to join the room and then uh, start with a couple of announcements and then kind of go back into uh, chapter nine. <coughs> So while people are joining, let me share something. Nope. Share screen. Okay, so I have gotten a bunch of emails from students who have had trouble logging into Mastering Physics. I sent out an email, I think about a week ago, and I just sent out another one. Uh, Oh, I got my hat. Where's my recap? <laughs> so I am recapping stuff. I sent out another email just uh, 10 minutes ago. So if you type in, let me open a different browser. If you were to just type in mastering physics, it's going to take you to a site that, let me annotate this, the site you want to be at is mastering is this uh, pearson.com mastering.com north america if you have this little piece mastering physics at the end it's going to take you to a different site that what let me just try it here to show you if i try and log in on this site it pulls up something that when i then go to log in it's asking me for my course ID. If you see this screen, you are on the wrong page. It often will redirect you to that site that uh, if you've typed it in before. So just letting you know that you want to go to this particular site that the end should yeah, just have that. Yeah, North America in it. I'll get to question in one second, but when you sign in, mouse, it should have your courses already there. And it should just be Knight PSE, fourth edition. PSE stands for uh, Physics for Scientists and Engineers. So if you have to enter the course ID number, you're on a wrong page. All right, let me just stop this share. Couple of good morning, good morning, good morning, guys. Good morning, good mornings. How do I turn the volume up? By turning up your volume. <laughs> I can't control your volume. So I can talk louder if I'm not talking loud enough. So one other thing I want to share before we jump back into chapter 28. Let me go to your online resources page. Up and one more thing. Let me open this in a new window. Open a new tab. Okay, share screen. So, a couple of fun, exciting things that I, well, exciting for me. <laughs> I like sharing resources. Uh, a couple things. So, one, just as a reminder, uh, I'm going to keep this page pretty much updated almost every day if I can in terms of when I have a lecture. So I did uh, do, 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 annotate, did already upload the lecture from uh, Tuesday. And there were some office hours where I answered some questions. I uploaded those. But a couple things I added that I want to show you is one, I found out that I can share my Microsoft OneNote notes with you, which I guess is pretty obvious. But I can share it both as Microsoft OneNote and as a PDF. 
So if you click on, let's say this one, uh, OneNote. So one, you have to have OneNote installed. But if you do, this is a nice option. This will, uh, sometimes it presents it in a slightly different order than I have. But as far as I know, this is sort of live, meaning when I'm done with a particular lecture, it's going to upload it to the cloud, and this link is always going to take you to the most recent edition. And once I'm done with the chapter, I will convert the entire notebook into PDF. So like chapter eight, I didn't do that much with, but it will just create a PDF of basically whatever notes I was using OneNote for. So a lot of times the problems I'll be solving, I'll do these on OneNote. And then just so you can access what I'm doing, I will upload that also. So let me just stop this and share one more time. So what I'm gonna try and do in terms of the organization of OneNote is, I'm gonna have just a bunch of different tabs open that each one will have. So one, I've got like a tab for lecture notes. So some notes, I'll just sort of refer to these. Sometimes I will write these next to it, but these are the notes that a student took last year at this time. She took great notes. Uh, the example problems, I've got just a tab for that. And then one thing I added, people have been asking for clicker questions. So I don't know that breaking out into breakout rooms is gonna work, but I've got the clicker questions here. We'll just sort of go through these when the time is appropriate. And I'll give you some time to chat maybe if you wanna do that. And then I've got the different, uh, tabs for each part of each chapter. So before I start the lecture for chapter nine or continuing it, I want to just open it up for a couple minutes or a minute or two. Any questions on the lab or mastering physics or chapter eight or nine, anything like that? So yeah, you can write the clicker questions down. And yeah, if I break off people into uh, breakout rooms, you'd have to write the clicker question down first. Okay, so if we are all good, I'm going to go back to our energy model, share screen, share. And I don't want to annotate this using, the other thing I've learned is that if I annotate stuff using Zoom, then one, it stays where it is and then it doesn't save it to OneNote. So I need to make sure I am drawing in OneNote, do that. Okay, so let's go to our just little energy overview. So one, here's our basic energy. Well, I guess even before that, I should talk about our definitions just as a quick little recap. And just so you know, I'm probably going to stop doing like a five or 10 minute recap every lecture just because these are on video now so you can rewatch them. But this is still sort of the beginning. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, I'll get to chat in a second if there's a question. So some definitions that we are going to be dealing with. One, energy. Energy is sort of a circular definition with work where Energy is defined as that property of a system or object which enables it to do work, which basically means which enables it to exert a force on another object over a displacement. System is just a collection of objects that we're going to be investigating or studying. You get to define the system however you want. So, you know, I could have, let's just say, a bunch of different atoms interacting. They're all moving back and forth. You can define your system as one atom, two atoms, five atoms, all of them. But the reason it makes a difference is because anything that's not part of your system is part of the environment. And the reason that's important is because we're going to start to differentiate between internal and external forces. Internal forces are forces objects within the system exert on each other. So if I decided to define my system as just these two particles, any forces these two particles exert on each other would be internal forces. Any forces that things from outside the system exert on the system are external forces. So if these particles exerted a force on either of these two, it would be an external force. I'm not seeing two particles. Uh, right here? I think you need to share your other window. 
Am I, do you guys not see uh, this energy overview right now? Absolutely not. We oh, do okay. see conceptual question 8.5. Oh, so let me stop share for a second. Oh, thank you for not saying share screen. Oh, you're seeing that. Oh, up, oh, stop share. Sorry, share screen. Ah, can you guys see uh, now these definitions that I was talking yeah. about? Yeah? Yes. yes. So the entire time I was talking and underlining stuff, you guys were seeing something different. <laughs> Yay, technology. Okay, so what I was drawing, let me just draw this again. Uh, so I need to draw on here, draw. Let me erase. Okay, so if I just had a bunch of particles, these particles are bouncing back and forth. They're exerting gravitational forces, electrical forces on each other. I can define my system however the hell I want. If I wanted to define it as just a couple particles, that's fine. The reason it makes a difference is because anything that things inside the system exert on each other are going to be called internal forces and they don't affect the total energy of the system. They just transform energy from one form to another. External forces are forces that objects outside the system would exert on objects in the system, and they change the energy of the system by doing work on it. So looking at our basic energy model, inside the system, energy can be transformed without loss, meaning, We've got these different forms of energy, kinetic energy, potential energy, thermal energy, chemical energy. Within a system, the total amount of energy is a constant. Let's say it's 100 joules. If I add up the kinetic energy, the potential energy, thermal energy, any chemical energy, and it equals 100 joules, that will never change as long as nothing outside the system is doing work on the system. So within a system, energy is being interchanged from one form to another. The way we transfer energy to or from a system is by doing work on it, by exerting a force over a displacement. And if I do positive work on a system, and again, I haven't gotten to the actual numerical definition, but if I do positive work on a system, I add energy into the system. If I do negative work on a system, energy is removed from that system. And you probably remember conservation of energy. If I have an isolated system, which means there's no external forces doing work, then no energy is being transferred from the system or to the system. That's when we have conservation of energy. The other big thing we're going to be looking at in this chapter is kind of what I was saying. The way you add energy to or from a system is by doing work on it and how much the energy of the system changes is gonna be equal to the total work done by external forces. This is why the definition of the system is important because anything that's not the system that does work is going to affect the energy of the system. Okay, let me pause here and see there was a chat. Oh, uh, we are on right now chapter nine. Can I just kind of think you can get a message for individuals if you need to. Okay, uh, so that's our basic energy model. The one sort of limitation of the model, we are not considering energy being transferred into or out of this system by heat. Just so you know, chapter 24 is all, or chapter 24, physics 4C is all about thermodynamics heat. All right, let me uh, see, is there a, Question from somebody. Let me stop this for a second. I might need to mute people. Mute all. I'm going to mute everybody for a second. You can unmute yourself if anybody has a question just about this energy overview. So, again, quickly the overview is got a system. Inside the system, energy can be transferred from one form to another, kinetic to potential, potential to kinetic, and so on. Total energy in a system doesn't change as long as nothing outside the system does work on it. If the environment does positive work on a system, it is adding energy to that system. If the environment does negative work on a system, it is removing energy from that system. And if there's no work being done on a system, 
then we say the energy is conserved, the total amount of energy doesn't change. All right, let me pause right there. That's sort of the big overview, review. Now I'm gonna get on to some new material. Going once with questions. Go go. Yes. So um, since you can define your system yourself, right? Yes. Couldn't you always define the system as isolated so there would never be work? Oh, you could. And sometimes we will expand your definition of the system. So how you define the system affects it. So, you know, if I wanted to define my system as the universe, then the total amount of energy is never going to change because everything is contained within the system. So work is only ever for objects outside of the system. It's only work done by objects outside the system on the system that affects the total energy of the system. So just to give you an example, so if I, let me do this as a white screen. Share, actually no, let me do this on OneNote just because I can go down here. So let's say I have a, can everybody see me drawing this? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's say I'm dropping a ball. There's two real ways to define the system. One, I could just define my system as just the ball. The other way I could define my system as the ball and the earth. And one of the things we'll see once we start getting to potential energy, potential energy is always an interaction between two objects. If I'm going to have, let's say, gravitational potential energy, the earth has to be part of the system because it's not just the ball that has potential energy, it's the ball earth system. So if I define my system as just the ball, then what we're gonna see is then gravity is an external force because it's not part of the system. So if I define my system as just the ball, then the work done by the external forces is gonna be equal to the work done by gravity because now gravity is an external force. So what happens is, as the ball is moving downwards, gravity is doing positive work on it, and it's increasing the kinetic energy of the ball. But if I define my system as the ball and the Earth, now the work done by external forces is equal to zero, because the Earth is part of my system. So the total energy of the system doesn't change. Now what happens is, as the ball is falling, it's losing gravitational potential energy, but it's gaining kinetic energy. So the total energy of the system is constant. But if I define my system as just the ball, now gravity is an external force doing work on the system, which is the ball, changing the energy of the system. Okay. So... Hey, I, actually, I really like that explanation. So again, we're going to start looking at this mathematically in a second. But how you define the system matters because the forces acting on the system are going to change the energy of the system. But if I expand my definition, I could expand it enough so that every force is an internal force. Okay, so, so work is essentially forces. Work is forces changing the energy of an object. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right, so let me then click to lecture notes. And what I want to talk a little bit about is getting this definition of work. So I kind of want to do this as a, almost right next to this. So in our setup, we have an object. And this object is already moving with, let's say, some initial velocity initial speed here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to exert a force on that object. And let's just consider this a one dimensional force. So it's just acting in the x direction. It's going to act on that object over some displacement delta x. So you know, I'm pushing this object over a distance of two meters, something like that. As a result of this, since I'm exerting a force in the same direction as it's moving, that is going to result in the velocity increase. Whoops. That's going to result in the velocity increasing. 
So now it's moving faster than it was before. So it's got some initial velocity to begin with. I exert a force over displacement. The end result is because of that force acting on the object, the object's velocity and speed increases. What we want to know is what is the result of this force acting over the displacement. So I don't know, you know how much it makes sense to do the exact same derivation right next to it, but it'll slow me down so I'm not talking so fast, so I kind of want to do this. Uh, Laura, quick question. You got a question, Laura? You can unmute yourself if you do. <clears throat> okay, if you do, let me know. So we're basically just starting with Newton's second law. As we know, the sum of the forces equals ma. And remember, this is a vector equation. So I could break this up into the sum of the forces in the x direction, sum of the forces in the y direction. We're only looking at the sum of the forces in the x direction, which we know is max. And we know that acceleration is just the change in velocity with respect to time. So in this particular case, we only have one force acting. So Newton's second law becomes, there's, this was just my A. Yeah, let me just do this right. Yeah, whoa, I just moved all of your pictures somewhere. Oh, wow. Ah, group chat. Let me erase this. Equals M dBx dt. So we only have one force acting, and so that force is going to be equal to the mass times the acceleration, or dvx dt. So here's the part that you may not have had for a while in terms of calculus. It's just the chain rule. I can write the derivative of the velocity in the x direction with respect to time as the derivative of the velocity in the x direction with respect to x times dx dt, right? This is just the chain rule in calculus. dv dt equals dv dx times dx dt. Well, dx dt is really just the velocity in the x direction. So what I can say is fx equals m, and instead of dvx dt, I'm gonna have dvx dx times dx dt, which is really Vx. Okay, so what I have is fx equals m vx dvx dx. And then doing a little bit of physics calculus, what I would do is multiply both sides of this equation by dx, and I get fx dx equals m dvx vx dvx. And now I'm going to integrate both sides of this equation. Integral of fx dx equals the integral of m dvx, I'm sorry, vx dvx. So here's a something where, you know, sort of the physics calculus is a bit different. So initially, this object was at some initial position, x initial and we ended at some final position, x final. By definition, the, we are integrating this left-hand side dx, this right-hand side dvx. So for these limits, I want the limit of integration for the right-hand side to correspond to the limit of integration on the left-hand side. So at x initial, it has some initial speed. At x final, it has some final speed. So then when I do this integral, Right now, this left-hand side, we're just gonna keep as the integral of fx dx from x initial to x final. So one, what we're gonna see is this left-hand side is how we're gonna define work. It is the definition of work. It's the integral of fx dx. This right-hand side, I basically just have one half m vx squared evaluated from v initial to v final and what i end up getting is just one half m v final squared minus one half m 
the initial squared. So this is sort of where the whole definition of kinetic energy comes from. We know that when a force is exerted on an object throughout a displacement, that force does work. And if that force is an external force, it's going to change the energy of the system. So going back up here, if I define my system as just this one particle, then what? It, uh, stay with me for a second. As this one particle then this force is an external force which we know is changing this energy of the system so going back here here is sort of the work being done on the system here is the change in this quantity some final value minus some initial well it's the change in this quantity one half mv squared since i know work has to change the energy of the system and this force is changing the motion of the system I'm going to define this quantity, one half mv squared. It's defined as the kinetic energy. So the definition of kinetic energy comes out of this equation and it comes out of the basic energy model. Forces acting on a system do work on the system, which change the energy of the system. In this very simple case, our system was just one particle. We had one force acting on the system, and that force to change the energy of motion of that system, which we just did some calculus starting with F equals MA. We end up with this integral of FX dx equals some final value of this quantity minus some initial value. The quantity is one half mv squared, so that must be some form of energy. It's the energy of motion. All right, let me stop this share for a second and open it up for questions. Laura, do you have a question I can answer? Yeah, I was just, um, I couldn't mute because uh, doing stuff in the same space my mom works. Yeah, no worries. But um, there was like a couple of questions that were in chat. Oh, yes. Uh, so let me look at these, yeah, so Every once in a while, you know, I'll get on a roll. I want to cover a specific topic and then I'll pause and then catch up on chat. Uh, is the environment doing negative work on a system the same as the system doing positive work on the environment? Yes. So let me think. A system doing negative work means that environment is taking energy away from the system and by, well, not by definition, but the reverse of that means the system is giving energy to the environment. So yes, it's doing positive work on the environment. Can you define the system as an expanding zone or would that contradict the conservation of energy since new objects are being included without them on a cosmic can count on the universe as a system? Ah, you know what, if I uh, remember, I, will, I might even actually have this, I think I have this on my YouTube channel under physics links. There's a really good video by Physics Girl and talks about is energy really conserved in an expanding universe? And the answer is no, it's not. And it's a way more technical detail than we're going to get into Physics 4A. We're not considering that. So in Physics 4A, once you define a system, you can't suddenly change that system. So one of the things we're going to assume is that objects cannot enter or leave the system. Uh, if a question asks for the work done on an object by a force, should we define those forces as outside the system? So if it's just asking you for the force, for the work done by a force, it doesn't matter whether that force is internal or external. We'll see the definition of work is just force dot product with displacement or the integral of fx dx. Okay, so let me just quick whiteboard, or no, let's just go back to OneNote. So summarizing all this, the big thing we have right now is, draw, the integral of fx dx equals one half m 
V final squared minus one half M V initial squared. I uh, see chat, I'll get to that in a little bit. This integrals from X initial to X final. Oops. Couple things about this, let me just say. This was derived for a very generic one dimensional example. So derived for generic 1D example. However, it applies in all dimensions. And even though we were looking at acceleration, which is dv dt, in one dimension, the speed and the magnitude of the velocity, the speed is going to be whatever the velocity is in the x direction. So even though this was derived for this generic one dimensional example, it applies in two and three dimensions. And in this equation for kinetic energy, one half mv squared, this v is speed, not velocity. Very, very, very important. So let me make sure I write that. V is speed. Ah, I keep doing that. V <laughs> is speed, not velocity. Why does that make a difference? Kinetic energy and all forms of energy are scalars. There is no direction associated with it. So, you know, if this was a live class and I was grading a quiz and you did something like kinetic energy equals one half, let's say the mass was 10 kilograms and let's say the velocity was negative four meters per second. If you used a negative sign in calculating the kinetic energy, that would be wrong. Why would that be wrong? Even though you're squaring it, it gives the same answer. Speed is always, always, always a positive number. Speed can never be negative. So if you were to put a minus four meters per second, that indicates a velocity. So going back, here is sort of our big picture for what we've covered so far. We had this integral of fx dx. This is how work is defined. And from our definition of the integral, this is really the area of the curve of fx versus x. So if I get the area under the curve of fx versus x, that'll give me the work. And how much work I do is going to result in how much the kinetic energy of an object changes. So kinetic energy is one half. I really don't like when it does that. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared. m is the mass in kilograms. v is the speed in meters per second. And k, the units of any form of energy, are joules which means if I look at this kinetic energy equation, kinetic energy has to have units of joules. The right-hand side, the units of mass are kilograms. The units of speed are meters per second, and I'm squaring that. What I get is a joule is the same thing as a kilogram meter squared per second squared. And since a kilogram meter per second squared is a Newton, a joule, is the same thing as a Newton meter. So one joule is equal to one Newton times meter. Okay, so what I wanna do is an example problem and then uh, open it up for any questions. So let me see if I can pop this up here. Example problems. I got one, do, 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 do. Okay, so this is example problem 921. And can everybody see this tab? Somebody give me a little uh, yes in the comments. Yes. Or, yes, okay. So a 500 gram particle is moving along the x-axis, experiences the force shown in the figure below. 
Particle's velocity is two meters per second at x equals zero. What is the velocity at x equals three meters? So one, it's a little annoying that they're doing this. Uh, keep in mind, kinetic energy always depends upon speed. But if something's moving just in one dimension, then whatever that component of the velocity is, is the speed. So you know, if something's only moving horizontally, it doesn't have a y component of the velocity. If its horizontal velocity is three meters per second, that's also gonna be what its speed is. So we have here a plot of force in the x direction versus position. I know that, draw, let's use blue. I know that work equals the integral from x initial to x final of fx dx, which is equal to the area under curve, which equals the change in kinetic energy. So if I look, I can get the area under the curve, which will tell me how much work is done. That will tell me how much the kinetic energy changed. And if I know how much kinetic energy it started with, I can tell you how much it's going to end with, which means I can figure out the velocity, in which case, I'm sorry, I can figure out the speed. So I know that work equals one half m v final squared minus one half m This little button on my pen is driving me crazy. I have m v initial squared. So I know my initial speed was two meters per second. I've got my mass was half a kilogram, half a kilogram. I can get my work from the area under the curve, in which case I can find the final velocity. So one, let's first get the equation for the final kinetic energy. So I have one half m v final squared equals my work done plus one half m the initial squared. I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by two, divide both sides of the equation by m, and I get the final squared equals two w over m plus the initial squared. And then if I take square roots of this, both sides, I get my final speed is the square root of two times the work divided by the mass plus the initial squared. So I have the initial two meters per second. I have the mass half a kilogram. I need to get the work from the area under the curve. So I want the area between x equals zero, which is where it started, and x equals three. Again, anytime you're trying to get the area under the curve, you're going to be getting the areas of rectangles and or triangles. So in this case, I got the area of a rectangle. The height of the rectangle is 15 newtons. The width of the rectangle is one meter. So the square or the rectangle portion has an area of 15 joules. For this triangle, Triangle has a base of two meters, has a height of 15. So the area of the triangle is gonna be one half base times height. So one half three meters times 15 meters. What is that? 45 joules divided by two, 22.5 joules. So this is problem 921. Let me just double check. We've got the total. The base is two meters, not three meters. Aha, thank you. It was like that. I thought it was an even number. Two meters. Ah, so we've got one half times two meters times 15 joules. So I have 15 joules. So is that right? So I've got the rectangle, I've got a base of one, height of 15, the rectangle portion is 15 joules. No, the triangle is just half of a twice as big rectangle, 15 joules. Okay, so my total work done 
is the area under the curve, which is 30 joules. So now I basically have everything I need. My final speed is the square root of two times 30 joules divided by half a kilogram plus two meters per second, the quantity squared. What I get, oh, this was an example problem. I don't actually have the solution. Duh. Anyway, what you get is a number. <laughs> and that number I could look up the uh, homework solution, nope. Desktop examples problems. I think it's like 11.1. 11.1? All right. That sounds right. I couldn't remember offhand. 11.1. Uh, Joe? Yes. What if you, if you have negative work? Uh, what about it? Uh, you can have negative work. We're going to see. So let me just give you a preview because we're pretty much, let me stop this for a second. Uh, stop share and just open up this whiteboard for a second. So just as a little preview of where we're going tomorrow. From this equation for work, which is the integral of fx dx, this equation always applies. So this right here is always true. But what we're gonna see on Tuesday or Monday is that for a constant force, meaning if the force is not changing, then I can show that the work equals the dot product of F dot dr, delta r. So the force dotted into displacement. The dot product, remember, is the magnitude of one, for, one, magnitude of one vector times the magnitude of the second vector times the cosine of the angle between the two. Magnitude of any vector is always positive. So the magnitude of F is positive, the magnitude of R is positive. Whether or not work is positive, negative, or zero only depends upon the angle between the two vectors. So let's say you had something which started off here and moved here. That means my delta R, or delta X in this case, would point to the right. Let's just use it as delta X. Now, if I have a force acting, whether or not that force does positive, negative, or zero work is going to depend upon the angle between the force and the displacement. If the force, so let's say my displacement is to the right, if my delta x is to the right and my force is at some angle between zero and 90 degrees, this force is going to do positive work and that's going to add energy to the system. If as something was moving to the right, that force was at a 90 degree angle. That force does no work, which means it's not adding energy, it's not removing energy. But if something is moving to the right and the force is acting at an angle between 90 and 180, so this angle right here, then the work done by that force is negative, which means that particular force is taking energy away from the system. A classic example is let's just say, you know, you're driving. And let me just clear all this. I don't need all this, uh, clear all drawings. So if you are driving a car, cars moving to the right and there's kinetic friction. Kinetic friction always acts in the opposite direction of motion. So if I look, my displacement, let's say, would be to the right. My force of kinetic friction is acting in the opposite direction of motion. So one, this is not a free body diagram. This is me indicating the direction of the force relative to the direction of the displacement. So here, the work done by friction would be equal to the magnitude of the force of kinetic friction, which is always positive, right? magnitude is always positive, the magnitude of the displacement, which is always positive, but in this case, the angle is going to be 180 degrees. Cosine of 180 is negative one, which means the work done by kinetic friction is negative, which means kinetic friction is removing energy from the system. 
So let's say my system is the car and the, the earth or the car and the road. Heat is being generated by friction, which, it, well, we'll get to this in a little bit, but. <laughs> so this is one of those things too, where it depends upon how you define my system. I could define the system as just the car, in which case kinetic friction is doing negative work, which is decreasing the overall energy of the system. But if I define my system as the car plus the surface of the road, then in this case, kinetic friction would be an internal force because the road which is exerting the friction is part of the system. So in this case, what's happening is kinetic energy is getting converted into heat. So depending upon how you define the system, you can look at energy a couple different ways. All right, let me stop this. Uh, stop share. And uh, we are at 12 o'clock. So what I'm going to do is stop this Zoom right now. I just need to use the bathroom, get a drink. I'm going to open up office hours in about three or four minutes and then answer any questions you have on this. One quick thing before I go is, we'll do one little share, do, 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 mastering, expert TA, open this up. I've showed you this before, but just in terms of getting ready for these Zoom lectures. We are now looking at work in kinetic energy, and then we're going into next chapter, which is going to be basically potential energy and interactions. So all of these videos under work and kinetic energy in the expert TA series. This is basically the equivalent of our chapter nine. And all of these videos here are basically the equivalent of our chapter 10. So I highly recommend watching these videos sort of as a little supplement. Again, keep in mind the notation is gonna be slightly different, but the content is the same. It's nice seeing it presented in a couple different ways. Okay, so um, wouldn't it be too? Let me just quickly see about uh, anything here. In okay, so I'm going to end Zoom session now. Start it up in about two or three minutes. Goodbye, everybody. I appreciate you all joining us live. All right, let me pause and meeting for all.